Uh, welcome uh, to this week's research seminar. Uh, for our speaker this week, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wesley Swingley, who is the interim chair and associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at uh, Northern Illinois University. Uh, Dr. Swingley holds a BS in biochemistry from Case Western Reserve University and a PhD in microbiology from Arizona State University. His uh, PhD thesis work focused on uh, genetic approaches to the study of uh, photosynthetic prokaryotes. Uh, prior to joining NIU in 2012, Dr. Swingley was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Hokkaido University in Japan and uh, University of California, Merced, where his work focused on studying genomes of uh, microbes in uh, natural environment. Uh, Dr. Swingley's overarching research focus is in significantly uh, expanding our knowledge of the evolutionary history of life on Earth by assessing whole genomes of major new microbial groups. His research also provides a framework for understanding microorganisms with uh, potentially fundamentally different metabolisms, which is part and parcel for evaluating the question, does life exist elsewhere in the universe? Uh, his research uses the following three approaches to tackle the central challenges in analyzing these complex environmental microbial communities. One, to develop novel computational techniques to inform a new generation of uh, genomic and uh, community genomic data, uh, model the co-evolution of organisms and the environment, and uh, third, illuminate the evolutionary origin and history of phenotypes and environmental adaptation. Uh, his research work is uh, primarily funded by the NASA and the NSF. Uh, I'm really glad to have Dr. Swingley at our colloquium to share his research work. Uh, the title of his talk today is uh, Disentangling the Complex Network of Soil Bacteria in a Restored Prairie Corona Sequence. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for being here and uh, take it away. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for the uh, kind introduction. I thankfully am no longer interim chair of my department. <laughs> I've escaped that role. So uh, back to more research and a normal life. And so uh, today I'm going to talk to you uh, very heavily about uh, biology. And so I've been doing uh, research that has intersected with computational analysis for a long time, uh, even though I don't have a computational background myself. My computational background started when I was uh, five or six years old, actually, when I got my first computer, uh, Tandy 1000. And I've been doing a lot of coding ever since, coding in, in BASIC on my very first computer, um, all the way to now, where I, I try to use some of this stuff for science and I code very badly uh, in, in getting through some of these problems. So. Bear with me on some of this, and, and hopefully I can present some of these problems to you in ways that open the question of, you know, how do we analyze some of this data? Biology and computer science are two really closely linked topics, especially given the current uh, state of biology. And it's really important to me that we make stronger connections and try to answer some of these really hard questions. First off, I, I want to acknowledge everybody first, right, because we... We have all of these people that work on these projects together, and it's not just me. I'm a very small part of things, and I want to make sure that all the people that worked on this get acknowledged. And first and foremost, that's students. You know, these projects are heavily student-driven uh, from all levels. I've had uh, everybody from high school all the way up through uh, graduate and postdoctoral fellows in my lab, and many of them have contributed to this project. You'll see the dates on some of these things. This has been running for about eight years now. And so naturally I have a lot of uh, students that have come through the lab working on this. And most notably, uh, Jared and Renee, you'll see in a little bit. And uh, more recently, uh, Des, Rush and Ali have been working on the project and continuing what was started uh, years ago. And then uh, in my collaboration, a lot of the work that you're gonna see and a lot of the figures and, and data that you're gonna see are through Nick Barber, my collaborator, uh, former, former coworker here at NIU, who's now moved on to sunny Southern California at San Diego State. But there are a lot of people working on this project together. And uh, luckily, we've been very fortunate to get funding through uh, both our university and uh, 
uh, local non-for-profit, the Friends of the Nechusa Grasslands, as well as more recent funding by the NSF for this project. And my work, as, as was uh, implied in that intro, my work is really looking at kind of a big picture question of how does life interact with the environment? How does life affect our planet? And a lot of my origin of thinking about this question was really an origin of life question, looking at how life interacted with our planet through the history of our, our planet. And so we've had these things like humans and plants and, and fungi for a very a relatively short period of time on our planet. And most of the evolutionary history of our planet was crafted by uh, microbes. And so these microbes may not be visible and they may not seem like an uh, important aspect of the planet, but they actually have a huge impact just by sheer numbers, sheer force of numbers and, and for being everywhere on planet Earth. And so what that means is that when we try to look at these questions, we have a lot of different aspects to them, right? And so I'm going to do something a little bit new today. So this is the very first time I'm using this. So I'd ask all of you to, if you have a cell phone or a browser on hand, go to slido.com and put in this code and you can interact with some of these uh, slides that we have throughout the presentation. We don't have a lot of people in here and these, uh, some of these things, like we're going to do a word cloud on this first one. Word clouds don't look that great with any, with, you know, under a hundred people, but we'll play around with it. And I'm kind of using you as a bit of a uh, guinea pig for, for figuring this out. So I'm going to ask first uh, the most complicated question, probably. What are the biggest challenges in understanding complex interactions? And that doesn't have to be life interactions, but understanding any sort of complex interactions, how do we say this thing interacts with that thing? The challenges, the answers, you want to keep them simple to see interesting things on the word cloud here. So, you know, computational power might be an answer or, you know, time or whatever it might be. So I'm curious to see if any of you have, have some thoughts. We'll leave this up here for just a minute. Causation, oh, that's a really good one. And I might even bring mine up to put some in myself. Let's see if I can get this QR code to work. Analysis. And you can enter as many as you want. Let's see what we get. I put in unknowns. Unknowns is a big one for me. Um, some of the other ones we're going to have a bit later are simpler, simpler word clouds. So hopefully we'll see a few more things come up. Data gathering. That's a good one. Data and data gathering. All right. So this is the first one. This we'll call this one our uh, our trial run. We'll have a couple more down, down the road. All right, understanding the knowledge under observation. So I'm going to touch on some of these. Oh, data, data took the lead, <laughs> and we'll move on this from this one now. So thanks everybody for uh, helping experiment with me, and I'm really excited that this is integrated straight into slides. I'm probably going to be using this tool a lot more. So uh, one of the things that I look at mostly because I'm a microbiologist is the direct interaction of microbes with the environment. And in a lot of environments, that means microbes interacting with other life. So the project I'm bringing to you today is talking specifically about life interacting with a prairie system. And so, as you might imagine, the biggest interaction there is microbes with plants. And we, we know just like we have microbes in our gut that interact with our food and with our body, plants, so too have the same thing in their roots. So the root system is effectively the gut of the plant where you have microbial populations that interact with the, the soil, the nutrients around those roots, and they interact with the roots directly. And there's a lot going on here. We have these interactions directly with the roots, the interactions with the chemicals from the roots. And this is an area that people have been thinking about and people have been studying for a long time. But I will tell you that when we zoom in closer on these interactions, this is the level of clarity that we get. You know, we have these close interactions between the roots and the microbes that are as clear as mud. And part of the reason for that 
is that this question has really been driven heavily by this idea of being able to manipulate that microbiome. So again, if we use the analogy of your gut, we think heavily about our gut in terms of health, right? Human health. And so the concept of manipulating your microbiome, keeping your microbiome healthy is the primary motivation for studying the gut microbiome. And we've of course developed probiotics and things like that that can help craft that microbiome in your stomach. And, and I'll tell you as a microbiologist that they work, but they don't work that well. Probiotics, probiotics are really a, a brute force way of keeping your microbiome healthy, right? You're throwing everything at it to try to make something keep balance. And that's kind of where we're at with the human microbiome. And we're even further behind in terms of plant microbiomes. So we don't really think too much about uh, using probiotics on plants but there are in fact plant probiotics. There are products that a, a lot of growers will use that add fungal communities to plant roots, uh, to the soil that you grow plants in, and maybe you know healthy microbial population or compost or things like that. Those are ways of maybe crafting that microbiome of the plant to grow better. And naturally these focus heavily on agriculture industry of you know, making money from plants. And so because of that, we have a limited understanding of the interactions between plants and their microbiomes. So my next question for you is, what do you all think? I have a slide, the very next slide is what I think, but I'm curious to what you all think the plant is that is studied the most for the plant microbiome. And again, you can put in multiple answers if you want, but I wanna know which plant do you think we know the most about? We got some of the obvious ones. I'm hoping, hoping that capitalization doesn't matter to the software. Let's hope it's developed well enough to not worry about capitalization, right? Uh, cannabis, I did not, hmm, that's a good one. I did not search for cannabis. Uh, we have soy, we have corn. Uh, legumes are, uh, soy is our, is our big legume. Rapeseed is a common uh, oil and, and biofuel crop, tomato. All right, we got a few on here. I'll give it a little time. Arabidopsis is a really good, good answer. So uh, some of you might not know. If you don't know Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis is the, the, the little white lab rat of plants. So it is the, the most studied plant because it grows really fast. It's a weed and that's, that's what people grow in the lab. It's just a teeny little weed plant and we can study the hell out of it. Uh, alfalfa, that's another good one, another uh, grain crop. All right, so oak we have on here as well. Um, so here's what I thought, here's what I looked up. Go to the next slide. So I thought maybe, I think I searched first for Arabidopsis actually, and Arabidopsis generated about 43,000 hits on Google Scholar, it's not too many. Um, I, you'll be surprised that nobody picked wheat, which came up on top. And actually, I was a little surprised by that. Wheat rhizosphere had the most. So the rhizosphere, I didn't mention before, is that area around the roots. Rhizo means root. So that area around the roots where you have this bacterial population and fungal population that interacts with the plant. So some of them that you had on here are, are up here. Soybean, corn, uh, pretty high. Tomato, I think was mentioned. Arabidopsis. Uh, not too many, and I picked a few oddball ones here too, right? Asparagus. Asparagus, I don't think too many people study, but there were a few asparagus papers out there. And the one at the bottom of this list you probably don't know, and that one is a bit of a cheat. That's actually two plants. So there's a, a prairie plant called big blue stem and a prairie plant called little blue stem uh, that are together studied about 1700. So that's a pretty low number, and that is probably one of the most commonly studied prairie plants. So you can see how far down that is on the list compared to some of these crop plants. Thousands of times uh, more, plant, more paper is produced on all of these compared to the, uh, the prairie plants. So that's a problem, right? That's, that's an area where we need to start thinking beyond crops because our world is not composed of crop plants. Our world is composed of a lot of natural systems. Oak was mentioned on there. Oak is a good example of a natural system where 
we, we know very little about the microbiome of those oak roots. We think of the oak tree as the most important part, but the fungi and the bacteria that interact with that tree's roots are probably uh, equally as important. And so one of the areas that we study on the left here is the Nachusa grasslands. So this is a really nice photo taken from a former undergrad here at NIU uh, named Atlee Hargis. And uh, he's let me use this photo uh, in way more times than I've ever attributed him for. Uh, and we've had students out there. So this is Jared and Renee. I'll talk about a little bit out there sampling in Nachusa. And then we have more controlled systems. So over here, this is actually the Morton Arboretum. And I'll talk a bit more about this at the end. But this is all centered around the idea that we need to think more about how microbes interact with plant roots. That being said, we know even, you know, seeing this slide that has all of these thousands of papers, I will tell you that we don't actually know that much about what's happening here uh, between these things. And so uh, I mentioned the Nachusa grasslands and some of you may know of the Nachusa grasslands. It's an area out uh, west of here, uh, west of Rochelle, Illinois, and probably about a couple hours away from you. And it looks like this from above, right? This photo here is uh, from April 18th, I think Google said. And so it's a little bit brown, uh, just coming into its own. And it looks like a lot of uh, crop fields, right? You can see a lot of these really crop field looking things, some little neighborhoods. But uh, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all this agriculture, is an area that's been maintained by uh, an agency called the Nature Conservancy for um, about 40 years now. And this area covers uh, a couple really large fenced areas here. So these red boundaries, you'll see these coming again soon. These, these are two fenced areas. There's a visitor center. And in fact, you see this visitor center marked on Google Maps where they've recently uh, welcomed the public to come and see some of their site. And there's a little bit of a hiking area over here, but a lot of this is closed off. Uh, a lot of this is an area that's specifically marked off for uh, a purpose will. I'll keep, I'll keep a little uh, secret right now and we'll talk about it later. But what that looks like to me and to the scientists working out there is actually a lot of different locations that have been planted throughout the years. And so the very first planting is from 1987. So in 1987, the Nature Conservancy started taking previously cornfields and soy fields and planting prairie plants. And uh, that one is right here, actually. That's this, this one right here next to uh, a site that's actually a remnant. And that means this site here was actually never uh, used as crop field. Uh, it did have grazing on it, but it was never planted for crops. And so it was just left untouched. And so this is what we'd call a remnant prairie. And there's another one over here uh, on the other side of it. So that part that I showed where the fences went around, that's this area here. And within that area, there are quite a few sites that, that we're sampling at. And these sites, as you can see on this figure, are fenced in because they now have bison there. As of 2014, bison were introduced to these areas. And so of course they keep the public out of these uh, areas, but there's viewing uh, and a lot of people come out there to, to view the bison. But each of these areas, each of these little drawn boxes here is a field that was planted at a different time. And you can see them planted throughout the different years, all the way up until uh, 2020, planted at the end of 2020. And some of these fields have bison in them. So we'll be talking about that a lot. But what these fields look like in terms of actual chemistry and what's happening in them uh, can vary quite a bit. And we often think, when we think of a really healthy soil, a healthy prairie, we think of this deep, rich black soil. But the reality is that soil loses nutrients over time. I should say it loses available nutrients. And that's because of these big giant things over here. So if you've never seen these big giant molecules before, uh, you certainly have no chance of identifying what they are. But the ones up on the top right are really common ones you've certainly heard of, and that is cellulose and hemicellulose. So cellulose is one of the main components of plant cell walls. So when you have plants and the plants die, you get lots of cellulose. And then this giant thing here is actually lignin, and this is the thing that makes trees hard. So when you think of a tree, 
and that tree falling over and, and decaying, this lignin is the stuff that's really hard to break down. And in fact, much of the lignin that trees produce ends its lifespan as oil, as hydrocarbons, because nothing eats it. There are very, very few things that eat this big molecule because it's just gigantic. Look at the thing. And so because of that, it sticks around. It sticks around, it gets buried, and then a few million years later, voila, you have hydrocarbons. And so these, uh, these things accumulate in prairies over time as you have plants living and dying and you have the things that, that organisms don't really like to eat stick around, those accumulate. And so over time, you actually accumulate more carbon because if you look closely at these things, there's lots of carbon, lots of hydrogen and oxygen, but less nitrogen. Uh, so if you look through here, you'll probably see no, no ends. There are no nitrogens on lignin, and, uh, and I don't think there are any nitrogens on cellulose either, right? So you accumulate these big things that don't have nitrogen. And because of that, they, these environments do actually become harder to live on. So one of the changes that we expect to see over time is that things get a little more spare, spare a little more sparse in terms of nutrients. So we actually see that the remnant sites that have never been plowed, never been planted, they actually have lots of carbon, less nitrogen relatively, whereas the agricultural fields that get fertilized almost every year have relatively more nitrogen, and so they come out on the bottom. All right, that's the first little bit of data I showed you, but we're actually going to get into uh, the big story. So uh, I mentioned Jared and Renee. Uh, they were REU students that were out here in 2014, and they sampled all throughout the summer. They sampled uh, seven times, I think, during the summer. And we published a paper on their work a few years ago, showing that uh, as, we, as we sort of expected, we had a lot of differences between these old remnants and the old prairies, that one that was planted in 1987, and the new ones, the things that were just planted one or two years before the study. And this ordination, you'll see something like this again. And uh, when I start talking about some of the data analysis, you'll see that one of the more common ways that biologists represent uh, sequence data is by condensing it to single points, uh, transforming it into a uh, different uh, axis, reducing the dimensionality of it. And uh, this one in particular is called a non-metric multidimensional scaling. And uh, we'll get into more detail about what that is later. But uh, at the end of the day here, what we saw was differences between these prairies that were planted at different times, right? Nothing, nothing too surprising there. But these are things that we wanted to dig deeper into. And we looked a little bit at some of the things that happened there. And these are just a bunch of uh, probably gobbledygook microbial names to you. But what we saw were there were a few big hitters. There are a few things here. You see acidobacteria, uh, acidobacteria, acidobacteria, acidobacteria. A lot of them that really seem to be important to this conversation. And these ones have shown up in other studies. So if you look at other soil research in, in prairie systems, you see these names a lot. So this was just kind of showing that, hey, some of the things that we think might be important there seem to be important, but that's not, that's not good enough, right? This is a really big picture overview. And we're just looking at everything from, from the large scale. And we really wanna look deeper. I really wanna know how these plants are interacting with the soil and making these microbial communities change. And so I love showing these figures because they're a disaster, right? So when we think about microbial data and sequence data, what it actually looks like often is something like this. So every one of the samples, every time we went out there, so this is in 2013, September 13th, we sampled this field called L, called Loudon. And this is the distribution of microbes in that soil. So we had maybe 100,000 uh, sequences from that sample. And this is what all 100,000 look like in terms of where they come from, what type of microbe they are. And when you do that over hundreds of sites, you get these big, ugly figures that look like this. But this is actually one step too far, right? The raw data really looks like this. And that is not very fun to look at. So this is what's called the FASTQ file. This is a, a DNA sequence file that actually has quality scores. So that's the Q in FASTQ. So here's our sequence that the machine has given us, and here's how strong of a, of a sequence 
the machine has told us it is, right? The machine says, hey, maybe these ones are great. We're pretty sure that's right. Uh, maybe this one is not so good and maybe you shouldn't trust it, right? This is a common way of looking at data from the beginning. And we get these files that have hundreds of thousands of sequence, sequences in them. And then we, of course, get hundreds of these files. And so my next question, and this is my last question uh, in tinkering with Slido is, what's the best way to handle sequence data? So some of you may have worked with sequence data before, uh, but some of you may have not. And so when you're thinking just about data handling, how would you handle a bunch of data where you have some sort of name, some sort of uh, you know letters that you have to you have to work with. You have to manage that in a way that is more simple than a big text file, right? So, what do you think? What would you do with all of this data in order to get to something looking more like something you would analyze with a computational pipeline? And now, maybe now is when we get into the. Uh, things that I don't understand, and we'll get into some of that further. RNNs, I'm going to guess that's a neural network. Oh, now we have neural networks, all right? Databases, alignments, and CBI comparison. I have no idea what dynamic time warping is. All right, I'm going to learn some things today. I'm really excited about this talk to learn some of this stuff. Uh, I see somebody put in the chat, but I don't know if I'll be able to get that to come up while well, I'm going through this. Recurrent neural networks. All right, cool. OK, so we got some cool answers here and some stuff that I don't know about, which is perfect. Uh, but I'll move on. And if you have other ideas, and especially as I go through some of this stuff uh, later on, if you think of things that make more sense for this, I'm definitely going to ask uh, for help and advice later on in this presentation to hear the you know the different angle of thinking about this data because we as biologists often will think of it in a very static way based on our experience and in fact that static way that we often think about it is through tools that are available and these tools change pretty regularly so uh, the current state of the art or the current standards for the field is to use a pipeline called chime it may be a q but the people pronounce it chime that chime 2 is a really just a set of tools. So Chime 2 is kind of a front end that has uh, hundreds, I think, of tools linked within it. And those tools really orient towards some simple things like quality control, handling those quality scores in the sequence data, cleaning things up, um, just to remove anything that we think might be garbage, all the way down to identifying what those sequences are. And so that's what Data 2 does. So one of the big challenges in looking at sequence data from the environment is that we don't really know what each of those sequences are right off the bat, right? If we see a string of characters, none of us scientists are smart enough to know what that sequence of characters actually is. We need computational tools to tell us that. And I saw a couple answers on there that were uh, good answers, I think, for smaller data sets, so alignment, uh, comparison to NCBI, those are ways that we often handle individual data. But for big data sets like this, where we have millions of sequences, they're not computationally tractable. And so these tools run uh, some fairly simple means. And, and as I said, these are ever-changing. So this Data2 pipeline is quite simple, actually. This Data2 pipeline is really just cleaning up the sequences so that you can name every individual variant in that sample as its own thing. So they have these things called ASVs, which are individual sequence variants that they've given some taxonomy to. They've given some microbial identity. Whereas an earlier tool that I used uh, from a place called the Ribosomal Database Project was actually a clustering mechanism. It, and, and many of those older mechanisms used things like nearest neighbor you know, tree building and clustering seemingly, I think, a little bit more advanced, and we've kind of moved backward to something a bit more simpler in this Data2 pipeline. So it's an interesting thing. The field moves forward and back, uh, and the field seems to, sh right now, seems to have settled on this Data2 pipeline, but I guarantee you in five years we'll be using something different. And once we get all that, we get something that looks usually like that, that first uh, bar chart I showed you, where we have just all of the things that are present in every one of our samples, and we can do some basic stats. 
So these are figures that my collaborator, Nick Barber, made of a couple simple things. So uh, one of the uh, statistical measures that we can really quickly do on samples is richness. If we look at the genus level uh, for these things, and we just count how many we have in each sample, what we see is an interesting little sort of smiley, smiley curve, right, or frowny curve, where in the young prairies, we actually have fewer things. The young prairies don't have as much diversity. That diversity goes up over time. We get this increase in diversity. And then as time goes by, the diversity goes down again. And part of this is due to that change in nutrient load, where the early prairie has so many nutrients that the things that grow really well tend to be what we would call weeds. And this is actually true of the plant communities. When prairies are first planted, those first couple of years, you see this explosion of really big weed plants. And then over time, that settles down, and you actually have the prairie plants that settle in. And then over time, as nutrients start to go away, some of the things that were a little bit more dependent on those nutrients being available start to go away. So this is an interesting thing because you see this in all kinds of data. You see this in plant data, you see this in animal data, in microbial data. And this is kind of the opposite of what a lot of people who are interested in environmental systems think of when they think of restoration. Everybody always thinks in terms of diversity and they say, I want to restore it to a natural system so it has higher diversity. When in fact, a really well-established system has lower diversity than a newly established system. So it's kind of an interesting take on this. And in fact, if you look at the types of site in general, those remnant sites have the lowest diversity of any of them. And the agricultural sites actually have the highest diversity. So what does that say? I don't know. Uh, another metric that we use a lot is Shannon diversity. And if you don't know Shannon diversity, it's uh, also called entropy. And it's entropy uh, where it's just summing up the proportion of every member of that community times the natural log of that proportion. Uh, so this is another common way of looking at it, but we get the same relative signal in both of these methods. So this is called alpha diversity by ecologists. I don't like the name very much because it's a little hard to remember what these Greek letters mean, but alpha is just looking at individual sites and seeing what their diversity is. But things are not so simple, right? In these sites, we have a lot of things going on. So we know, for example, that carbon is important to microorganisms. Microorganisms are built on it as they are on nitrogen, water, of course, as well. And fire affects how much water is available. Bison affect how much input is in there. Season, time affect it. And of course, carbon and nitrogen interact with each other and fire interacts with those. And then bison interact with carbon and nitrogen. And then the point being, this is very complex, right? This is a system where we have a lot of factors interacting with one another and interacting with the microbial community in ways that we maybe don't think about or we can't understand. And I'm, I'm going to tell you by the end of this that, that this network looks much more complicated than this little uh, bit of a mess that I put on here. But uh, this is our, our foundation to work on, right? We have a few of these major factors that we're focusing on. And uh, Nick, being an ecologist, is very good at stats, and I, being a microbiologist, am not. And so uh, all of the stats data here is from Nick. And one of the things that we do commonly in in ecology and in microbial ecology is looking at these factors to find which of them actually matter, which of them are driving the data. So we anticipate that something like carbon or nitrogen availability might impact that. And in fact, it's interesting if you look at a general, generalized linear mixed model, so GLMMs. This is a, a really common, and I've seen it called machine learning, even though I have uh, my, my doubts on how intelligent these algorithms are. But generalized linear mixed models are a way at identifying which factor associates with uh, another factor. And so in our case, we have a big factor of our sites is age when they were planted. We want to know whether age interacts with moisture, carbon, nitrogen, carbon and nitrogen ratio, whether bison interact with these things and on and on. And what we see is that age does, similar to our first study that we published with Jared and Renee's work, age does interact with 
the richness and diversity, very weakly maybe with the richness, uh, stronger with the diversity, or not very weakly, but less, less strongly. Uh, interacts with the carbon and nitrogen level, right? That carbon and nitrogen over time changes due to age. And in earlier studies, we've seen that the square of the age may interact better. In this case, through our you know, years of looking at this data, we've seen it doesn't. Um, we're interested in bison, whether bison interacted with that. And, uh, and we'll get to some more of that fire season, these sorts of things. So this is a common way of starting to look at data in uh, microbial ecology. It's just doing some sort of mixed models to see how things interact with one another. And then looking maybe, uh, in this case, we sampled, we've been sampling since 2013, looking at the data to see where these interactions might be strongest. And uh, in our case, we have data from just the fall of 2013. So we've combined it with 2014 full year data, and then data all the way through 2018 that we're looking at right now to see whether age is a significant factor in these microbial communities at the site, bison, fire, and season. So this study, the work I'm gonna to talk to you primarily about today is focusing on thinking about bison and fire. And these use this uh, Bray-Curtis dissimilarity. Uh, I'm not gonna to get too much into detail on this, but Bray-Curtis is a way to tell you whether two distributions, in our case, distributions of microbial communities are similar to one another or not. And there are quite a few metrics for doing that type of thing, but Bray Curtis is one of the more commonly used ones. Okay, so we've done some basic statistics. And as I've told you, we have bison there now. So uh, Carly uh, Davidson is a former student of mine that first started doing work with these bison. And these bison are big giant animals and they're big, basically big pooping machines. I will tell you from going out there that uh, very shortly after the bison arrived there, we had bison poop pretty much everywhere on the prairie. And so we anticipate that these bison are probably interacting with the nutrient load in the, in the prairie a lot by pooping all over the prairie, by eating certain plants, by trampling and doing all of these things. And, but we don't know. And in fact, people don't really know this for the plant communities, the animal communities, insect communities, things like that. So this is an active area of study where we introduced these, not we, the Nature Conservancy introduced these big grazing animals to the prairie as a way of maybe helping the bison communities for one, you know, increasing uh, conservation for bison, but also as a way to make this prairie look a little bit more like a traditional prairie system where we had millions and millions of bison throughout the Midwest on our prairies but we didn't really anticipate any results. Do the bison affect the prairies good or bad? Uh, nobody really knew. And so, as I mentioned, we have these, uh, these five years of data, five plus years of data that we're putting together. And again, one of the ways that we commonly think about data in microbiology is by doing this dimensionality reduction. In this case, this is a principal coordinate analysis, which some of you probably know, if you didn't know uh, the non-metric multidimensional scaling, uh, you may know principal coordinate or principal component analysis. And this is a way, again, of taking this data where we have thousands of characters in the data that we're comparing to one another. We can't plot that in a two-dimensional you know, XY plot or even a three-dimensional XYZ plot because that, the dimensionality of that data is on the order of thousands. So these get compressed uh, into these through, through an algorithm such as PCOA. And uh, we commonly will cluster these together to say that any given sample from a year, how similar is that to one another? So if you've not looked at clustering like this before, any point on here, any circle on here is a single sample. And that single sample is compared to all the other samples on here. So if it's close, these, these two are close to each other, they're more similar than they are to things that are further away. That's basically it. And what we saw by looking through these years is that the no bison sites, the sites out there that we've sampled that don't have any bison, uh, cluster with the older bison sites, the older restorations that have bison introduced. And we have this big difference with the younger bison sites. So the sites that have just recently been planted and now have bison on them seem to be over here during anomaly, right? 
And when we look by year, what we saw is that that held true. And so one thing I won't necessarily uh, focus on too much right now, but I'll talk about a bit later, is that this first year here, 2013, 2014, this is actually before the bison. So keep in mind, any signal we see in this year, even though they're labeled old bison and young bison, this can't be caused by bison, right? There are no bison there. And in 2015, we have bison at some of the sites, uh, primarily at the young bison sites, but not at the old bison sites. And then we have all of the bison things going on. So uh, this was our first look. This is, you know, how similar do these things look to one another? Do we see any changes in these coordinations that might indicate things are changing over time? But this still, again, I'm still not getting to the point, right? I'm still not identifying those things that we really wanna know. How do the plants and the microbes interact? This is the big, the big picture. So if I wanna get at those, that's a challenging problem. And this is where the computer science comes in, right? We have millions of sequences from all of our years of sampling. We have thousands and thousands of microbial lineages, the, the things that were identified from that sequencing data. We have hundreds of, of sites and samples, hundreds of samples that we've taken over those years. I think we're at about 450 samples right now. And then over those years, and we have eight years, we sampled three times a year uh, through most of those years. So we have a lot of uh, dimensionality to that as well. So we have lots of data. And my, uh, one of my close collaborators on this project is a guy named Josh Phillips at Middle Tennessee State University. And he, he laughs at me when I say we have a lot of data because uh, we have a lot of data, but we have a low uh, sample count of data. 450 samples, you know, that's not a lot of samples, but each of those samples is quite large and quite complex. And I'll show you a bit later how uh, we make things a little bit more complex for ourselves. But this is the conversation that he and I are having right now. It's finding ways to pull out of this data, the things that we actually want to pick out. And um, be, me being a biologist, one of my first steps in starting this was playing around with decision trees, and in, in particular, playing around with random forest algorithms. So random forest it is a really basic machine learning algorithm, and I used it because we can actually see what these things are that differentiate the nodes on the tree. So a random forest is a, a bunch of decision trees put together uh, to make some sort of final classifier. And that classifier in our case is gonna be used to classify whether a site doesn't have bison, whether a site is an older site that has bison or whether a site is a younger site that has bison. So that's what you're gonna be seeing for the next few slides. But of course, if you're not familiar with machine learning or if you haven't played around too much with machine learning, you might wonder what the point is. And one of the ways that I usually describe this to my students, to my biology students, when I'm first talking about machine learning is cats and dogs, right? Differentiating cats and dogs. And this is a really easy visual way to think about classification, where if, if I gave you the size and weight and hair length and tooth length and you know, all of these sorts of features about an animal, then I would ask you, can you tell me whether that's a cat or a dog? And there may be cases where, you know, you have these Bengal tigers that are gigantic. You know, maybe this Bengal tiger is hundreds of pounds and it's seven feet long. If I gave you the information of seven feet long and, and a few hundred pounds, I don't think there are any dogs that are that big, right? So you could easily say, based on those features, I'm gonna call this a cat. But if I gave you something house cat size, you don't know that house cat is probably the same size as a, a chihuahua or a fox or something like that. So those features are not going to be informative for that decision. And so what you're going to end up with, if you gain a bunch of features, gather a bunch of features from these cats and dogs, is again, some sort of reduced dimensionality representation of hair length, tooth length, weight, all of that. And you're going to have to draw a line between these that's going to differentiate cats from dogs. And you could draw a straight line that may not uh, do a very good job in the data because a St. Bernard and a, a mountain lion are maybe the same size and weight. Or you can draw a, a smart line through there that's gonna adapt to points 
and give you a clean differentiation. It's going to predict every cat and dog right based on the data that you give it. And then you also, of course, run the risk of overfitting, where if you add in some new animal that you just found, you might not different, you might not call it right, right? And a good example for this that I often point to is hyenas. Hyenas, I think we all know of, uh, hopefully you all know of hyenas. They look like big dogs, but hyenas are actually more closely related to cats. And so if you looked at all the features of a hyena, just from a, a layman's eye, you might actually think and classify that as a dog but it's gonna be classified as a cat. And so that's something that can mess with your machine learning algorithm. Hopefully some of that's preaching to the choir. But, uh, but what I really wanted to get at when I started playing around with these is what's happening in these trees. I wanna know if I get a classifier that works really well, and I did get some classifiers that worked really well at differentiating the data, how are they working? And, and in fact, what organisms are driving that? What is making this work the way it is? And so there I picked into some of these uh, trees just to look at, at what we're seeing. And this is really basic here, right? We have a tree. This tree has some, some early branching nodes that maybe differentiate the big picture, some tips that maybe differentiate uh, little things. And in the end, what we get is a bunch of microbial data and how well it works. And so in my case, I have a bunch of microbial uh, taxonomy that's called by that DOTA2 pipeline, how often it's used in my trees. So the ones that are used in more trees, we might presume are more important. And then how those correlate with the data. And so if something is counting a lot of things, splitting a lot of branches, saying something is correlated with bison, that'll be a lot of bison positive. If it's only, you know, ever correlating against bison, that'll come up as bison negative. And and going through all this, and this is a big mess, and I'm starting to talk too long, so I'm going to trim it down a little bit here to just show you that those bison that we brought in seem to really not be doing a whole lot to the old prairies. And that might not be too surprising. These old prairies that have been planted 30-something years ago, maybe those resist change, right? They, they have their thing. They're stuck in their ways. So when you bring a bison to them, not much changes. But we did have a few key groups. And it doesn't really matter too much what these groups are, but we have a few key groups that when we brought the bison in, those changed by increasing or those changed by decreasing. When we looked at that original data, going back to this coordination, we actually saw that the old bison sites and the bison-free sites stayed together throughout this clustering, except maybe in the last year, in 2018, right? So maybe this doesn't surprise us. The old bison aren't really changing these sites. But in this figure, if you look closely, the young bison is this big array of diversity that kind of shrinks down so that by 2018, it's, it's about the same size as these others. So maybe more is happening here. And in fact, that is true. When we look at these classifiers, the things that are really driving the, the trees and driving that classifier are the changes that are happening in young prairies. And there are a bunch of groups. Uh, this one's a really interesting one. That the nitrogen cycle seems to be an interesting story in the early prairies. The early prairies presumably have a lot of extra ammonia around from fertilizer. And as that ammonia goes away, maybe these nitrifiers go away because these are the things that munch on that ammonia. So we have some stories that we can then start to pick out of here. And we have some stories that relate to what we saw in our earlier broad overview study, that there are acidobacteria groups, some go up, some go down. This is a, a bulk characterization, but there are individuals here. So we can find out what some of these individuals actually do that are changing in these sites. So it's a very cool story, but keeping in mind, this is just one factor, right? I showed all those factors early on and I talked through all this complex data that's just a big mess. And this is just for bison. This is just talking about bison, right? So if we wanna talk further about this, we need more control. So we need a controlled system and that's where the Morton arboreting comes in. So the future of this project is going in the direction of this collaboration with the Morton Arboretum where they've established this huge grid system. So this is 437 sites that they've controlled the plant communities in these sites. They planted these in 2016. 
and we've been studying them with them ever since and doing uh, microbial sampling on these for the entire time. And what each of those sites looks like is something like this. So that big blue stem that I mentioned to you earlier on, that's this thing here, Andropodium germanii. And that Andropodium at Martin Arboretum is in plot 68, 87, 92, 94, blah, blah, blah. And these bolded ones are actually monoculture. So plot 68 in this grid, wherever 68 is in here, that plot 68 right here, that is only Andropodium germanii. Right, so that is a monoculture. So presumably, whatever microbes are in that soil are exactly what big blue stem want. Big blue stem loves those microbes. And so these are ways that we can start to get more accurately at what's happening in those sites. And then when we start to mix plants together in site you know, 87 or 92, maybe we can see, does that microbiome look like Andropodium's microbiome? Or is it totally different? Does somebody else drive that population? There are 130 prairie plants in this. So when you think about that earlier picture where I showed most of the data that we have is on wheat and corn and soybean and all of that, this is 130 plants that we probably know nothing, literally nothing about their root microbiome. And so this project also comes with collaboration with uh, some people at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California in a, a lab of Trent Northern an old grad school buddy of mine, has developed these little cool little arrays where you can actually grow plant roots in a controlled condition. So we can see directly what those plant roots are doing to their environment and directly how microbes interact with those plant roots. And so this is what's going to be happening in uh, a big project that we have. So we have an NSF Rules of Life grant that was just funded last year. And this grant is going to be getting soil chemical parameters. So these physical chemical parameters of the soil are things like carbon and nitrogen, phosphorus, moisture, pH, all of that for the soil out at Morton. They're also doing plant and root features. So they describe the plants and the plant roots through a number of uh, uh, plant biology comparisons. We're going to get the root exudates. So we're going to understand what chemicals those plants pump into the soil around their roots specifically. So for every single plant, hopefully, we'll get this chemical composition that they're pumping into the soil. And then we're going to do direct studies on how those chemicals interact with the microbes. And then hopefully do some classification and prediction. So if you remember this little figure that I showed you before that was a complex mess, we're going to be adding even more on top of that. These are not just plants in this environment. These are now plants that have features and exudates and all of that sort of business. And so this is going to be incredibly complex to put all this stuff together. My uh, collaborator at uh, Middle Tennessee State, Josh Phillips, is by far the you know, savior in this whole thing in trying to find ways to put this together through machine learning. And, and I know it's not a miracle cure. I think if you talk to biologists, many of them think that machine learning is the magical answer to everything. Uh, but he's excited about some transformers that have been uh, coming out lately. Not these kind of transformers, but uh, some transformers that people use for uh, image analysis and image interpretation uh, seem to have some really good use cases for our sequence data. And so uh, I thank you all for listening to so much biology. I know that was a lot of biological background uh, with a limited you know, computational analysis to this point, but this is something that we're really looking forward to expanding in the future and looking for advice, input, and collaboration. So I welcome any questions and any follow-up if we don't have time for them. Thanks, everybody.